Now, before we dig into Judges chapter number eight, I actually want to just recover something that we uh, talked about last week in Judges chapter seven, and just that story where the uh, where God keeps trimming down the troops, right? And and, he, and he's like, "No, you still have too many. No, you still have too many. No, you still have too many." And um, when they came to the water and he separated them to, to get only 300 people and he said those that, that took the water and lapped it up to their, to their you know, put it up to their hand and, and uh, to put it up to their mouth and lapped it uh, that way, those are the ones that God wanted to use and that's how he proved them. And I said before, I said, you know, I didn't quite know what this meant. I wasn't that certain about it. And if anyone knew, you know, hey, someone got a good idea, come and talk to me after service. And Brother Peter talked to me after service. And um, I think he's spot on with it. And, and it was just like, I was really close to that. It, it lines up perfectly with everything else. I was preaching on this last week. But this makes perfect sense. Because I was, I was kind of going this direction anyways, but I didn't preach on it because I didn't really know. So I didn't want to just start going off into, into some stuff I didn't. But, but I feel very confident that this is a very valid application of this. Now, I think there's probably other applications as well. Um, but I just want to bring this one up since uh, we just covered this last week. But it also kind of fits in and makes sense as we continue in chapter 8 as well. So you'll, you'll see how this correlates in chapter eight similarly. But basically, we're not told how far they have to go in order to get to the water. He says, bring them down unto the water and I'm going to try them there. We have no idea how long that is. We don't know how, how, how fast they went, how hard he drove them or whatever. But we know that when they got there, some people were so thirsty that they got on their faces and just drank, right? You don't, no, no one normally, I think, would drink that way unless you were really thirsty. I mean, I don't think that's anyone's normal drinking pattern is to just fall on their face and just suck up water straight out of the water source, right? But I could see people doing that when they've been exerted, when they're tired, when they're weary, they're thirsty, like, oh man, we, you know, we've been hiking this way, we just need to get something to drink. And as opposed to people who, yes, I'm weary, yes, I'm tired, yes, I'm thirsty, yet still remain the, have the composure and the discipline to be able to scoop up the water and drink and drink appropriate amounts. I mean, the other thing is, too, I mean, even just on a physical aspect, you never want to just suck down tons of water all at once. It's not good for you. It's going to give you a stomach ache. I mean, it just, it's not good for your body to do that. So um, yeah. these people, I believe, were, were demonstrating that they didn't have the discipline that they were going to need in order for God to use them the way that he wanted to use them. Now, we saw last week in that chapter that those people, they didn't have their sores. They didn't get in a physical fight. They had to creep up and everyone had to be in line. Everyone had to be in order. It was a timed thing. They had to all hold themselves, hold the line, be steady, have their pitcher ready, have their trumpet, and at the sound, smash their pitcher, blow with the trumpet, right? And not get scared and not run away and have not just the courage, but the discipline to be able to stand there, hold the line, and, and then continue from there. So we saw that last week. And I think that the, the difference between the way that the people drank has everything to do with that. that. I think that's a very good application of that. And I was already you know, kind of touching on that in general in the chapter anyways. And then continuing on when we get here to chapter 8, we're going to go through verse by verse. But one of the things that you're going to see, these people continue to fight. Like, they beat that huge host but there's still 15,000 that remain going into chapter 8. And they're chasing after them. And they're chasing after them. And they're going after them. And then they finally destroy the 15,000. And they're still going after the kings of Midian. They're, they don't stop. And people aren't helping them out along the way. They come to two different towns going, hey, you know, we're chasing after these kings. We're weary. We could use some food. We could use a little bit of water. You know, can you just help us out a little bit? And they're like, no. 
yet they continue. That requires, now, chasing after people in battle, and then they go, and then and, and they say, they come back to those towns before daybreak. So they're not sleeping, they're not eating, they're fighting. That's a pretty strong force you got there. People that are able to, to withstand such conditions are disciplined. They weren't ready to get, I mean, the people who were afraid to begin with, they got sent home because there's no way they would have made it all the way through. I mean, they were scared at the beginning. They're, they're already going to be ready to, to just call it quits and, and get out of the fight and say, I've had enough. I'm done early on. And then the people who just couldn't even contain themselves to get that water, that's going to cause problems too. And you, what you don't need is a large group of people going, hey, we, we've we fought enough. We're done. Why? Because that infects everybody. That can get the morale down and the courage down of everybody, even those 300 then that were willing to continue to go and to fight and everything else. They might just be like, well, there's only 300 of us left now. Right? Obviously, there's more going on. Obviously, God wanted to make sure he got the glory. And, and there is more to the story than just that. But we can still get that, that learning and teaching from it of, hey, if you want to be used mightily in the, in the big fights and the big battles that God has going on, these spiritual battles, and you want to stay in it and you want to stay the course, you need to be disciplined. It takes discipline. Go through all these challenges we're going to be doing this year in general. It should help you to get more disciplined in your Christian life, in your Christian walk with the Lord. From your Bible reading to your praying to your soul winning, everything that we do, your church attendance, everything is going to require discipline in order to continue doing that and do it on a regular basis and to make sure that you are a workman that, that is studied, that is approved unto God, that you know how to use the word of God, that you love people enough to go out and preach the gospel to them, that you love people enough to pray for them, that you are willing to put in the time necessary to really make a difference and to really stand strong. So then that way, when the persecution does come, because yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. When you start living the right way, you start living righteously, the persecution comes, you've been disciplined enough to know and say, I'm going to make it through this. I'm going to keep fighting and I'm not going to back down and we're going to keep on going strong. Because I've been well-trained, well-disciplined, and I'm going until I breathe my last breath. And this is the way that the men of Gideon and his, and his group, the way that they fought, they're going until they breathe their last breath. They were weary. They were worn down. They didn't sleep. They didn't eat. And they kept fighting. And they won. And they won a great victory. And we need to just, just remember, these, these are great, edifying, I mean, these are, this is an awesome story. This, this fires me up, man. I love these stories. If you can't tell, I this, is, this is great. And it's in God's word for a reason, for us to be able to learn from it and to, and to be strengthened by it and to understand, hey, we need to get ourselves strong, get ourselves strong spiritually, get ready for the battle, get ready for the fight. There's a lot of fighting in the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed that. Especially as you're reading the Old Testament, there's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of battles. This isn't a cakewalk. We don't, uh, Christianity isn't just a kumbaya fest. We don't bang on bongos and just, you know, throw up peace signs and, and that's it. You know, I mean, hey, look, I'm all about love. I am. I, 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 want, I, I, want, I love people enough to tell them about hell. I love people enough to tell them how much Jesus loves them and wants them to go to heaven when they die. I love them enough to tell them the truth. I'm all about love. But the way that, that we understand love and the way that the Bible teaches love is not the same way that most of the world sees love. They see it completely different. These days, they look at sodomy as love. These days, they look at perversion as love. They have no idea what love is. Not a clue. When you start getting that backwards on things, 
you don't understand love at all. Yeah. I digress. Let's get into Judges chapter 8. <laughs> Verses 1 through 3, we're going to see here the humility that Gideon has as a leader. Now, we've seen already he had some fears, he had some doubts and things, and God helped him through that. But Gideon really was a humble man. He was humble from the beginning. He was a who am I in my father's house, you know, or the least, you know, similar to Saul. Okay. Gideon turned out a little bit better than Saul, but um, he handles this situation here. And we'll read the verses, but basically what happens is that the men of Ephraim get upset. Because they're like, well, we wanted to fight. Why didn't you call us to the fight, right? As if, like, you know, you're just getting all the glory now. We would have been there with you. Like, why didn't you? you know, we wanted to go fight too. Why didn't you call us? And they start getting really angry with Gideon. But what Gideon does, he uses a lot of wisdom and humility as a good leader should, right? You don't always, as a strong leader, just counteract someone that's kind of coming at you with an attitude, and just stamp them down, right? There's other ways to deal with things and, and to um, overcome some evil with good, as it were, and to just show some humility. And, and what he does here, he's being a great peacemaker. Because why? What they're saying and doing, it's not hurting him anyways. Now, if he had a lot of pride, it would hurt him. If he was lifted up and full of himself and they just come at him and start saying these things to him and he was full of pride, he would want to attack them. He'd want to put them down. He probably would have started a fight with them. But that's not what he does. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. So they're pretty upset about this. They chide with him sharply. I mean, they're really giving him a hard time about not calling them to the fight. Verse number two, and he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Now, at the end of chapter 7, Gideon had sent the messengers to Ephraim. So after they already got the Midianites on the run, he sends to go have Ephraim come and join in the battle. And they're saying, why didn't you call us earlier? But when the Ephraimites came, they, they also partook in this victory. And, and you know, they were able to run down these two princes, Orb and Zeb. Now, they weren't, they weren't the kings of Midian like we're going to see here in chapter 8, but, but they were high up. They were princes. They were, they were their own kings, their own princes in their own right over their area. And they were two very uh, high targets, right? High profile people that the Ephraimites were able to bring down. And so what Gideon's doing here, he's saying in verse 2, he says, what have I done in comparison of you? And he, he, when he says, is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? What he's saying is that he's leading the people of Abiezer. He's the one that, that, that was in charge with that battle there and, and that was there for the main part before he called Ephraim. So the vintage is basically the best of what they had to offer. He's saying the best of what we did is nothing compared to the gleanings of what you guys, did. the gleanings are just the picking up the last few remaining. You know, when you go and, and harvest a field, you harvest your grapes, whatever you go through once and you get, you get that big harvest and then you go back through again to get everything that you missed the first time. Those are the gleanings. And he's saying that the gleanings of Ephraim were way better than the vintage of what he had done, than the best of what he had done. Why? Because they got Orb and Zeb. Because they're the ones that can say, hey, we got these guys. So he throws that back at them in order to pacify them, in order to keep the peace. Instead of lifting up himself and going, well, I didn't need you there. We, you know, just be glad I called you in the first place. That would have just caused more problems. And this goes to similarly to my point of um, when you're dealing with people in general, we want to be peacemakers 
as much as we can. The Bible says, as much as lieth in you, you know, live peaceably with all men. As much as we can. So when we go out, so when, when we go to the apartment complex, or when we go places where people don't want us or whatever, we try to do things as peaceably as we can. Let's not go and, and just intentionally have this big attitude of we're here to, to, you know, there's nothing you can do about this and I'm here and I'm, you know. We can deal with things reasonably. Now, if people are going to be unreasonable, it doesn't mean we're going to get afraid or we're going to tuck tail and run or anything like that. But we're going to try to be peaceful. We're going to try to be reasonable. If the men of Ephraim had just continued and continued and continued and just made an issue out of it, you know, then, then Gideon would have been forced to do something. But he handled it wisely. He said, look, you guys have done way better than me. He allowed them to have glory and honor and everything. He didn't need all of that on himself. He didn't care about that. Hey, we're, fight, we're all fighting for the Lord here. You guys did this great thing. Good for you. We don't need to be worried about someone else getting, getting magnified and exalted you know, over you. Who cares? Let, let God be the final judge of that anyways. And you know what? In, in Gideon's case, God was the final judge of that. Who are we reading about for three chapters in the Bible? Gideon. Who's the main character, the main focus? Gideon is. Is it the Ephraimites? No. Do they get a mention? Yeah. And, and part of it, half of it, is because Gideon keeps the peace with them. And they're starting to cause problems. God exalted Gideon in God's time. Gideon didn't need to worry about some, you know, people getting upset or whatever. He kept the peace. And that is a very good skill to have and a very good lesson to learn, especially in leadership. You don't want to be the guy that's always just the jerk, just, just barking at people and, and talking down to people. Be the one that leads. Be the one that leads by example. And be the one that just says, hey, okay, hey, you guys did a great job. Good for you, right? And not mocking. I'm not doing this mockingly. I'm saying, hey, good for, you know, good for the Ephraimites. Great job, guys. You got Orb and Zeb. I didn't do that. You guys did. Good for you. Thank you. And you're going to keep everybody happy that way. And they're brethren. I mean, they're all children of God. They're all children of Israel here. There's no reason to have this bickering and this fighting. Now, when we continue on, now that's the problem with Ephraim. See, there is a problem, it seemed, just within Israel in general. There's a lot of dysfunction. Because on the one hand, you've got Ephraim getting all upset about, you know, not being part of the battle and everything else. Now, at least they were willing to fight and willing to stand up for what was right. And they, they wanted to be in the fight. But as we continue on here, we're going to see when he gets to Succoth and when he gets to, um, uh, what's the other place, uh, Penuel, which are also places in Israel, they're not even willing to help. They're the uh, fair weather sports, fair weather fans. When, if things are going right, depending on which way the wind's blowing, Okay, we'll help you out, but otherwise, no. I mean, if there's any risk involved, you know, we're just going to kick back and see how everything plays out. We don't want to be involved in this. These are the ones that truly were afraid. See, when Gideon stood up and he's like, we're, we've had it with these Midianites. God is with us. God's going to deliver us. Let's go fight. A lot of people got excited about that. But you know what? These people... They're like, I don't know. I mean, I don't like to be oppressed anymore, but uh, well, let's just see what happens. I mean, if we stick out our neck, you know, then if we lose, then they're going to come down on us harder. And I don't know if I want to do this. You know, I don't want to get involved. Let's just, let's just see how it all plays out. Because we're scared of, of them, and there's a lot of them, and I don't think it's going to work out very well for us. Let's read what happens here. Let's reread it. Verse number four. The Bible says, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. 
And the princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmanah now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmanah into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. So they refused them even just to give them some food because they're weary and they're hungry and they're fighting. They're chasing after these guys and they're like, look, we need to have, you know, some, some, some food here. And they just say no. These are the, uh, like I said, the, the fair weather fans. They need to pick a side. You know, who are you for? And when it comes to the Lord's battles, you know, you need to pick a side. Who are you for? Are you for God or are you for the world? Are you for the God of this world or are you for God up in heaven? Yeah, that's right. And you need to just make the decision that says, well, depending on how things go is what I'm willing to say. And unfortunately, this is the way a lot of Baptist churches have gotten. A lot of believers have gotten. They've lost their salt. And they're no longer willing to say, I'm going to put it all on the line for the Lord and I'm going to go fight for God. And instead, they're only willing to say what's not going to get them in trouble. Right. right? Because what was the problem here? Well, we don't want to get in trouble. I mean, if we give you food and then you guys lose and you're going to come back and then we're going to get in trouble. Right. And, that, and that's, that's not being very politically correct for us to give to, to, for us to support you guys. We can't show support for you. Now, even though secretly deep down inside we're for you, but we can't publicly display that we actually support what you're doing here. Because look, they didn't want to be oppressed by the Midianites. But they, they were too afraid to even show any support. And we've got too many people today, too many Baptist churches that are afraid to just say what the Bible says. Yeah, that's right. Because it's just gotten too politically not correct. And, they, and, you know, and these Fox News Baptists, these ones that just sit at home, they get all their theology from the TV these days, and they're only willing to say what the Republican Party is willing to say, what their favorite talk show host is willing to say. That's as far as they'll go. They won't push it any further than that. They won't say, well, this is what the Bible says. They're too afraid of the repercussions of that. You might start sounding extreme if you say, I believe that the homos should be put to death. Because the Bible says that that is the judgment. But that's too extreme for them, right? They might get in trouble by all their other Fox News buddies that say, no, 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 no. Hey, we, we should come out strong against gay marriage. Oh, yeah. Oh, Target's not letting, you know, they're, they're letting men use women's, we're going to make the stand against that. How about we put the filthy perverts to death? That's where I stand. And you know what? I think that's where God stands. And, and I could show the scripture to prove that. That's where Gideon stood. Gideon's going after these wicked Midianites and not stopping until they're gone and not stopping until they're out. But these other watered down, lukewarm Children of Israel that God wants to spew out of his mouth because they're lukewarm. We got the verse right up by the coffee machine in church. Go read it if you don't know which one I'm talking about. Revelation. Great verse. That's how God feels about the lukewarm Christian. You're not hot. You're not cold. You're just, you're just coasting by. You want to you wanna live the Christian life you want to think that you could follow Christ and have zero persecution and make sure that everybody only speaks well of you and that no one's going to speak evil against you falsely for the name of Christ because you're not saying anything that anybody might possibly speak evil against you falsely for. You want to play it safe. And when you play it safe, you're on the side of wickedness. Because if you can't stand up and shout against the wicked, then, then what good are you? You need to be taught. And I love the way that Gideon teaches the lesson that these people had to learn. Now, it's also important to understand this, that in their desire to not have anything bad happen to them and in their desire to try to stay out of it, what happens to these people? Well, it doesn't turn out very well for them. 
In Succoth's case, we're going to get there in a minute, they get, they at least have their lives, but they get severely chastened. Severely chastened. Chastened worse than any of my kids have ever gotten chastened, I'll tell you that much. They get a thrashing. We'll cover that. But when it comes to Penuel, they lose their lives. He goes back and kills those, the men of that city. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8. He says, And he went up thence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So they're basically taking the same position. We're not going to help you. Oh, where is, where is Zeba and Zalmanah? You don't have them yet? Yeah, yeah. how about you go get them first and then maybe we'll help you out? You wicked people. And it's these, these fair weather Christians that, hey, if it's popular, great, yeah, we're all for it. But as soon as something turns unpopular, as soon as people might start getting upset about what you say, zip the lips. And not only zip the lips, it's, yeah, we're not going to stand with you. We're not going to have anything to do with you. These are the same people when, when uh, I'm thinking years ago when Pastor Anderson was in the news and the Sodomites started going down the list of all the churches that he had on his website because he wasn't all about himself. He's saying, hey, these are all great churches and had all these churches for people to attend that, that were soul winning, KJV only, and they were right on the gospel. Those criteria, because I think that's great criteria to have if you're going to go to a church somewhere. I think that's pretty good. I think I could fellowship with someone that goes soul winning, that has the right gospel, and that, and that has the word of God. I think I could fellowship with that person. I think if, if they're trying to serve God and they have those fundamentals and those basics down, great. I'm going to go, attend, I could go attend that church. I could go do that. That's fine. They may be different on some other doctrines, but look, we've got the basics down. Let's go win some souls to Christ. So he's got all these people on there, but then what happens is someone gets a little bit upset at the preaching, at the hate preaching, how hateful he is against perverts and pedophiles and, you know, really wicked people. And then, they, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't have anything to do with that. Phone starts, uh, I, I need you to take me off that list. I need you to take me off of your recommended churches list. I, you know, while he's sending people that are probably some of the best church members that these churches have seen in a long time by having that up there, the people who actually care and love the Lord and want to go soldering and want to do the work, then they're going saying, oh yeah, just remove me. I don't, I don't want to be seen with you. We're not going to give you any bread while you're weary while you're in the fight, while you're in hot pursuit of these wicked people trying to destroy them and trying to just get them out of here, when you're, when you're in the battle, we don't want to help you at all. Now watch. When, when the nation actually starts coming around as if it ever does before God just rains judgment on us, if, if, if people ever start coming around, you know what? Then you're going to start hearing, oh yeah, we're, you know, we believe the same way. We always have. And it'll, it'll treat it as if nothing ever happened. Sure. And you just want to ignore everything else. That's the way these people operate. Bunch of cowards. But see, that, that, God's not happy with that. And God will make sure that the, the chastening and the discipline comes when it's appropriate. And obviously... Um, we're, we're, we're looking at this story and, and making the, uh, the symbolic reference to our spiritual life here. Let's keep reading. So it says um, in verse 9, And he spake also unto the men of Peniel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. So both of them are saying, You know what? When I come back with these people, when I come back, you better watch out. And he says this tower. So what were they doing? They were putting their confidence and their strength in their tower. They thought they were safe. They were well protected, right? They don't have to help these guys that are, that are putting their neck on the line to go and fight against the, the evil. They already felt they were safe. Well, what do we need? 
We don't need to get involved in any fight. We've got our tower. We've got our defenses. We're all fine. We're all good here. And he came back and showed them they weren't all good there. It says in verse 10, Now Ziba and Zalmanah were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of the hosts of the children of the east. For there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. They already killed 120,000 people. Why are these people still not getting on board yet? And it shows you there's, still, there's some people I think may never get on board. I mean, 120,000? I think that's pretty good success. I think, I think that should already give you an incentive to say, I think I'll jump on board this, this train, right? I think I'll start showing my support now. It looks like they're winning. That wasn't enough for them. Nope, you got to have it completely done, sealed. That's it. And that's wicked. Look at verse 11. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha and smote the host, for the host was secure. So he goes and kills the other 15,000, the, the rest of the host. Verse 12, And when Ziba and Zalmanna fled, he pursued after them. And these guys still run away. I mean, all of their army has been decimated, and they're still on the run, still trying to get out of there. And they don't just let them go. They pursue after them, and took the two kings of Midian, Ziba and Zalmanna, and discomfited all the host. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up. What a day, huh? <laughs> As I mentioned, I'm not going to go in depth on that, but man, talk about a long day. Fighting, warfare, you know, they're, they've done a lot. Now, I don't know if they just didn't sleep at all because this is how things work. I mean, they, 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 they had to get some rest. I mean, they stopped in these cities to try to get some food. You have to. I mean, you can't just be like running like sprinting, like you're chasing after someone, like on their heels. That's not what was happening. They were, they were pursuing after them and not giving up the chase, as it were, but like you could only go so far as a human being and before you need to, to stop to, to try to, to you know, get a little bit of rest and continue going. Um, but this is what was happening. And um, they were still able to make it back before the sun was up. I mean, it's still into the night. Now they're coming back. Verse number 14 says, And caught a young man of the men of Succoth, and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Succoth, and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. Seventy-seven men. So they, they catch someone from Succoth, and they're like, Okay, you're going to give us some information now. You know, who are the elders? Who's in charge here? You tell us who they are. Tell us what they look like. Describe them unto us. Where are we going to find these guys? Because they're serious. They're coming back to deal with the problem of them not getting the help that they needed along the way. Verse 15, And he came unto the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmanna, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmanna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? Saying, Well, here they are. Why don't you take a look at them? We're back. Guess what? They're in our hand now. Oh, now you're going to give us some bread? Verse number 16, And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succo. So what did he do? He took some branches that had thorns on them, thorns and briars, and what he said he was going to do with them in verse 7, again he said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and in my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And then it says there in verse 14, or verse 15, that he taught them, or 16, he whipped them. He gave them a whipping. And not just a whipping with a switch. The switch had thorns on it. I mean, it, it was cutting up their flesh as he's teaching them, no, you're done wrong. And that's why I said, you know, this is, this is worse. You know, kids are like, <laughs> can't, can't imagine that. I mean, the worst they ever gotten is like a belt or, you know, it's not a, Nothing with, with sharp, you know, drawing blood and, you know, that's not, that's not the way you're supposed to discipline your children anyways, by the way. These were grown men, all right? And yeah, you know what? When they're not a child anymore, you might need something a little bit, a little bit more to, uh, to teach, right? When they're young, they, they don't need that type of teaching. But this is, this is what they got. He taught them. And, uh, and showed them that that must not have been pleasant at all. 
Um, and then in verse 17, it says, and he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. So what do you do? He destroyed their tower. Oh, you think this is, you think this is going to protect you? You think this is giving you your strength? He destroyed the tower and killed the men. It's a pretty wicked thing to do to not support them. They're supposed to be helping them. They're supposed to be on their side. They were being oppressed too. And, they, and they're like the narcs. They, they would pro they'd probably be willing to go and, and, and tell on them. Oh, you know what? I saw we didn't help them at all. We're, you know, butter up to the Midianites. You wicked people. This is what happens. Be careful when you make your choices in life. What side are you going to be on? Do you want to take the coward way out? Do you want to go the safe, the safe route? What do you think is safe? I'm only going to say things that are popular. I'm only going to say things that everyone's going to thumb up on, on Facebook and I'm going to get all these likes from the world, from, from everybody out there, from all my relatives, from all the people, just from everybody. I'm going to get this. This is going to be on the news and everyone's going to love it and I'm going to get all these likes. And if I can't do that, then I, I probably just won't even say anything. Don't be like the men of Succoth. Don't be like the men of Penuel. Let's keep going here. Verse number 18. The Bible says, Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmanna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? Now, we don't have any uh, extra information on this. But obviously these kings had gone in and oppressed peop the people of Tabor and, and killed people there. We already know that they were being oppressed. I, I, went, I tried to do some research on it. I couldn't find uh, Tabor really. There's only a couple mentions of it, but nothing that would signify what this, what this is about. Um, and we really don't have any other information other than the book of Judges, kind of what's, what's happening in this time frame. So we don't see. This is, this is something that had happened recently. This was a recent occurrence that these kings had done, and they had, uh, and they had killed, they had killed some, some Jews. They had killed some people of Israel. And, it says, and, and he says, well, well, what type of men were they? And they answered, as thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. They're saying, they, they look just like you. And, they're and notice how they're trying to butter him up here. Do you look just like the child of a king, right? Like, like you're the, you know, which, hey, I don't blame them. I mean, they, they just got their, they just got their rears totally destroyed. Worse than the men of Succoth did. And it says in, uh, in verse 19, and he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if he had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. So he's saying, you know what? Those were my, like, my literal brothers. Like my, those were the brothers that my mother gave birth to, like you killed my brother. So it was personal for him. And he tells his son, his firstborn son, hey, you kill him. Kill him, son. This is, what, this is how we get rid of these, these wicked people. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. So the Bible tells us that his son was afraid. But the reason why I was okay, afraid is because he was a youth. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a youth. Everybody's a youth at one point, right? But you don't want to stay a youth forever. You want to put away childish things. You want to put away things that you, you know, things you're into when you're a kid. Great, when you're a kid, there's no problem with that. Kids should be into kid things, right? Totally fine. It's when you start growing and it's time to stop being a kid. Yeah. It's time to put away all the, the toys and the things that, that you thought were cool and the games and the whatever and, and start doing things that men do, that, that adults do. And um, his son wasn't ready to take the life of uh, you know, these kings. He was afraid to do it. I think that's okay. He was a youth. Now his dad's trying to teach him what's right to do. 
But it shouldn't be said of someone, you know, who's an adult, someone who ought to know better and, and ought not to be as fearful as a child and be able to just go up and say, I'll do that job. And, you know, that's not a, uh, an easy job. I guarantee you that's not an easy job, you know. I think people talk a lot about, you know, oh, man, I'll kill this person. I'll take another life or whatever like that. And, and for the vast majority of people, it's just a lot of hot air. I personally have never been in the situation of having to do that, and I thank God for that. Not some bloodthirsty person by any means, as much as, you know, people online might want to say that I am. I don't, I'm not just out for the blood of people and want to just kill people and everything else. I think, I think that there ought to be punishment for crime. Absolutely. And you know what? If I had to be the one that was in charge of executing judgment, I would do it. I'm up for it. It's not something I'm salivating over. I just want to you know, have this, this great desire to be the one doing it. But you know what? I've grown enough to be willing to do what needs to be done. And when hard decisions need to be made or when something that's not very pleasant needs to be done, it needs to be done. And we need to be mature enough and grown enough in our faith to be able to make hard decisions. Right? Now, I'm not talking about killing somebody. I'm talking about just making any type of hard decision. Putting your neck out there. Doing something that's kind of difficult. Doing something that, that you know is right, but it's not something you want to do. You know what the right thing is to do, but you're just, Ugh, I don't really want to do that. Do what's right. Step up. Grow up. And, and you know what? Being an adult, sometimes you just have to do things that you don't really like or enjoy doing, but it needs to be done. The kids, I understand when kids don't do things even if they're right, because they get scared, because it, you know, they don't really know better. But the adults, shame on you. You need to do something that needs to be done. Grow up and do it. What's right is right. And as the people in the chapter, they didn't, they didn't seem to understand that. What's right is right. Help out the people. Verse number 21. The Bible says, Then Zeba and Zalmanah said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmanna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's neck. So they're just like, we don't want the child to kill us anyways. Like, like why don't you just come and do it? Because they're, you know, if the kid doesn't get all the way through when he's, when he's going to kill them, it's going to be a lot worse for them in their death. They're just like, yeah, you're strong enough. You just do it. Just, we're okay with that. And he does. He rises, he, he rises up, kills them, and, and gets the, the spoil. Verse 22, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now everyone's behind him. The men of Israel said unto Gideon, Not just the men of Abiezer, not just the men of Ephraim, not just the men of Penuel, not just the men, well, there was no men of Penuel left, right? But... Not just the men of Succoth, right? They're saying, the men of Israel said, hey, rule over us. We basically are saying, we want you to be king. We want you to rule over us, your son, your son's son, right? They're just willing to set, because why? Because they're happy that he got this victory. And this isn't some rare thing. This happens throughout history a lot. I mean, people who want to just say, they, they, they look to the strong military leader you know, and as in this case, Gideon was. Gideon had the strength and the courage and the guts to, to stand up, to be a leader, to, to fight these battles, to win these battles. And say, hey, you're like a protector for us. Why don't you look over us? Why don't you protect us, Gideon? You, your family, your kids, your son, your son. You guys could just rule over us because we don't have any guts and you do. So why don't you just rule over us? And that is the wrong attitude to have. When you see a good leader like that, you should say, wow, I want to be like that. I don't need you to rule over me. I, I want to be like that. I want to be a leader too. I want to stand up and do the right thing. I want to be able to face the enemies. I want to be able to defend myself. I want to be able to look out for other people. I want to do those things. Not just saying, well, 
why don't you just, just take charge of everything? No. They're basically ready to make Gideon king, but you know what he does? He refuses. Now, we need to be careful not to put too much emphasis on the man also. I'm not taking anything away from Gideon as a man. Great man. But he was just a man. He had fears. He had doubts. He had other problems. You know, he had his own problems. He was just a man. He doesn't need to be exalted too high. And, and that's what they're trying to do. They are trying to elevate him higher than he ought to have been elevated by making him some king and just this, this, this great ruler over everybody. And um, the Bible says here in, in 1 Corinthians, chapter, you could turn to 1 Corinthians if you like, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to start reading in verse number 6. The Bible says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. The warning that he's giving is that you, you need to learn, he said, learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Don't start elevating the status of man. Don't start lifting them up so high that it's just, I mean, you've gone overboard, right? That, that, you don't realize that they're just, and you start getting puffed up for one against, you know, this man over another man. He already in the previous chapters uh, talked about, you know, in, first, in chapter number one, actually, 1 Corinthians, you know, some of you say, I am for Apollos and I am for Paul and I'm of Christ. And, I, you know, and there was this division because they started elevating people and just starting to be like, well, I'm this guy's follower and he's my leader and he's my, you know, you don't need to have the divisions over men that you're, you're elevating probably too high. Right. Now, leadership is good. I'm not saying leadership is bad. There's anything wrong with that. And strong leaders are a good thing. It's good to follow someone that's following the Lord and, and amen and amen. But um, you need to be, just be careful on how much you want, you're going to elevate someone. Gideon should have been respected and honored for what he did and, and great and thanked and everything else. But they took it too far when they're just saying, well, you just be the king then. You used to be the ruler, you, don't, you know, no. And we'll get to this in a minute, but there's a difference between being the judge and being the ruler of like, like a king would be, okay? Because we're reading through the book of Judges, judging what's right and what's not. We'll get to Gideon's response in a minute too, but I want to finish here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So verse number 6, he says, you know, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Verse 7 says, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? What he's saying is, well, why are you any different from anyone else? If you think you're going to boast and brag and be lifted up over something that you just received as a, as a gift, it was given to you. If you just received something, how could you glory over that? Who are you better than anyone else? And in this case, you can say Gideon, God fought the battle for him. Now, Gideon stood up and said, hey, I'm here. I'm willing. Use me. I did, did, obeyed God's commands. But who, who won the battle? Was it Gideon's hand that won the fight? No. God won the fight. God won the victory. God won the battle. Gideon did as God instructed him. God was the one in charge. God was the one that gets the credit and the glory and the honor for the victory. Gideon received of God. Where can he brag about that? This is the same attitude the Apostle Paul's trying to explain to people. It's the same attitude that he tried to have too. He said, look, and, and we'll get to that in just a minute in 2 Corinthians 12. You know, people are elevating the Apostle Paul. Why? Because he was doing great things for the Lord. He was, he was giving a lot of scripture. He was used to to give a lot of the New Testament. He, he was used in a mighty way of God, but he was a man. These weren't just all his, you know, his epistles are not just his words. I mean, that's the word of God. He's received that. Just like you receive your salvation, you can't brag about that. Jesus did the work. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He gave you that gift. You can't brag about that. I just received it for free. And that's what he's trying to explain, even with these leaders that may be doing great things. They received that from God. 
what I have in my life and, and to whatever level that, that I'm able to help other people out or do my service to the Lord, the only reason I'm able to do anything I can do is because God helped me to get, to get where I'm at. Not done under my own strength, not done under my own power, what he's done for me. He gets the credit and glory for anything that I do for him, whatever that is. And I'm not saying it's like the Apostle Paul and just saying whatever, whatever amount of work that I'm able to do as in a leadership position that I'm in right now, you know what? God's going to get the glory for that. I just received. And I'm just willing to say, I'll just do it. God, tell me what you want me to do. But I'm not different than any other person. You're not different than, you know. Verse 8 says, Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. And he's saying, you reigned as kings, and I'm glad for you. It was the attitude that Gideon had. Hey, Ephraim, you guys did great. I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you got Orb and Zeb. Verse 9, for I, think, for I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. That's the life of a Christian. That is the life of somebody who's following Christ. Why is it so hard for people in today's Christian culture to understand this? Anybody that wants to call themselves, so I love Jesus, I love God. Really? Is this what your life is like at all? Like even a little bit? Like anywhere close to this? Do you get any persecution? Do you get anything going wrong in life? Do you have anybody, you know, saying one bad word unto you at all? Ever. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Gideon's being called to rule as a king and his, and his son's after him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 6, the Bible reads, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. He said, even though I want to glory, Paul wants to, I want to brag. He said, I'm not going to be a fool. Why? Because fools are going to glory. Fools are going to brag about what they've done and where they've been. I'm not going to be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. So he's saying, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to glory. I'm not going to do any of these things. I'm going to withhold. I'm going to forbear because I don't want anyone to think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. No one needs to be, he's like, I don't want anyone to think any higher of me than already what's going on, you know, what the, or what they see. And he says in verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure. So exalted too high, that's what above measure means, if you get exalted too much, through the abundance of the revelations. So it's talking about his revelations, what God has given to him. He's, he's revealed things under the Apostle Paul. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So God is basically keeping things in check with the Apostle Paul and his life and, and his ability to not glory. Why? God's revealed so much to the Apostle Paul. God has given so much to him. And he wants to make sure, hey, don't lift him up too much not just for Paul's sake of remaining humble, but I think for other people around him as well, that the messenger of Satan came to buffet him, which means to hit him and to afflict him. And it wasn't just this spiritual thing. The apostle Paul had something go wrong with him physically. And I think it had to do with his eyesight, but you know, there's, I'm not going to get into all that. We're, we're way getting way over time. Anyways, you can read more about that and study the life of Paul and see, you know, he dealt with, 
something physically. And it says in verse number eight, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So three times he's seeking God, God, help me with this. Help me with this affliction, with this problem, with this ailment that I have. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So physically he was made weak somehow. And you could read in other epistles how he's saying, you know, you've received me anyways, and you were willing to give of your own self, you know, how people entreated him still, even though he was afflicted, even though he had whatever problem that he had. And, and God just says, hey, look, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Good enough. I don't want anyone thinking it's all because of you, Paul. But God continued to use him. He's just, he made him physically weak somehow to be able to do that. It says, um, and then the Apostle Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Hey, the more these things happen, the more reproaches, the more persecutions, I'll glory in that. I'll brag about that, that I'm being persecuted more. Why? Because then I just know that God's going to be with me even more, that God will strengthen me more. Because if I'm going through a lot of hard times, then God's going to have to strengthen me even more. So, great. Amen. And that's what he's saying. He's basically saying, bring it on. I'm happy to go through even more. Why? Because God's going to carry me through. And then that way, when God carries me through, how about some more glory and honor unto God for carrying me through? Because I was weak. But God got me through. Now, as I mentioned before, so they're trying to make Gideon this king. We ought to give honor where honor is due. And Gideon, I think, was, was definitely worthy of some honor. Just from men, worthy of honor. Obviously, God gets all the credit and glory. I've already gone over that. But even just in this instance, if you had someone that rose up as a leader, yeah, you're gonna, you should honor him, respect him, everything else. You know, he could be the judge, but just not set him to rule as king. And um, his answer in Judges chapter 8, verse 23 it says, And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Amen. That was the right answer. Gideon is right on here saying, You know what? I'm not going to rule over you guys. I'm not going to be your king. It's not going to be my son. It's not going to be my son's son. How about we just look to God as our king? Turn real quick to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're almost done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through the, the rest of the chapter, what we have here. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Basically, Samuel is kind of like the last judge. Because after Samuel, Saul is, is um, ordained as the king. Saul is chosen to be the king of Israel, and then he becomes king. So right now we're reading through the book of Judges. This is in the days of Israel when they had people as judges as their leaders. And they judged Israel. And they judged according to God's law. God being the king. God being supreme. The Lord being the boss, the king, the ruler. That's the way it was designed. Israel was designed to be. God gave us the laws. Who's our, who's our, our rule giver, our lawgiver? Our lawgiver came from God. That's, that's the government gave that, you know, God is the government. God was the one who said, okay, here's your laws. And there's one say, okay, we need help understanding, interpreting, and applying these laws. And that's what the judge was for. Just like judges today, right? There's laws on the books. Go before the judge. Judge is going to apply the law as necessary because he understands the law. He know, he's supposed to know the law, right? And that's what a judge is supposed to do here. So look to God as the king, the lawgiver, and, and the judges will apply that. And that's what Gideon was, and that's what these other judges were. But they wanted to make him ruler. Well, this same sentiment comes back up in Samuel's day, except, see, with Gideon, it's because he won this great victory. 
in Samuel's case, they loved Samuel and Samuel did, you know, he, he killed some wicked people of his own. He was, a, you know, a strong leader. But his sons were not. His sons were not following in Samuel's footsteps. So the people got kind of worried about this going, well, hey, you know, we love you, Samuel, but you're getting old and your kids aren't going to be able to, to rule after you. But again, they, they've got this wrong mindset. When you go through the book of Judges, it's not this, um, um, what's the sinking word? What's the, the, the um, when it goes down from generation to generation to generation, it's not, it's not lineage. lineage. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of a different word, I think, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't go by that. That's not, that's not the rule in the judges. It's whoever is going to serve God. They could come out of any tribe. It doesn't have to be that, you know, it's, it's not this whole lineage of, of kings, right? But that's how kingdoms are run with kings where it's, you know, father to son, to son, to son, to son, to son, this whole kingly line. And you're just king because hey, well, your father was king and because his father was king and his, you know, and, and that's why. Whereas in God's kingdom that he set up for earth, the judges were to be anybody who's going to step up. Who's going to be the leader? Who's going to, who's going to serve God? They could be lifted up and exalted to that position to be the judge. It had more to do with being a good judge than it had to do with your birthright. So, um, anyways, the people in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Samuel's upset. He said, why do they want a king, God? You know, I, you know, this is what they want from me. This is what they're asking of me. But he goes to God and he says, you know what? Don't worry about it, Samuel. They didn't reject you. They've rejected me. Why? Because they didn't want God ruling. When, when, they, when they decided to be done with judges, they're not rejecting that last judge, Samuel, as being the judge. You know, he wasn't the king anyways. They wanted a king. Why? Because they wanted to be like the rest of the world. They wanted to operate like the world. They were done being a peculiar people and distinct from the world in that sense. They just wanted a king to, to fight for them. Why? Because when you're God's people, you got it. You, he, he actually holds you accountable and responsible for yourself. And, and there's a lot more individual responsibility, but they just would rather have a government there to do things for you. Hey, you fight our battles for us. We don't, we're sick of fighting. We don't want to be involved in this. Why don't you just fight the battles for us and we can just go do our own thing? That's what they're looking for in a king. But if you're going to be in, in God's realm, he's saying, no, there are some battles and you're going to have to fight and it's right. And this is what you need to do. Um, but Gideon realized and, and, and had the integrity to say, I'm not going to rule it. They, they were offering up a lot of power. You'd be the ruler. I mean, he'd be able to do, say, do whatever, basically. But he had the integrity to say, no. No, God's going to be your ruler. God's going to be your king. Look to him. Now, just following this, Gideon ends up making a bad decision here in verse 24. It says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Now, we're getting way over time, and this wasn't in my notes, but there's only a few times where earrings are mentioned, especially in reference to men. I don't think it's right for men to wear earrings. And I think it's always uh, uh, looked upon as a negative thing, regardless of culture. What they're bringing here, what, the fact that they mentioned, hey, they were Ishmaelites, that's why they had earrings, is pointing out that it wasn't everyone had earrings, it was the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites are not the people that you want to be emulating as far as who's righteous. Not in Scripture, at least. That's not what they're, uh, <laughs> that's definitely not what they're exalted as. They're not, they're not the, the chosen people, right? They're, got, they're not the seed of promise in the broader sense of things. Um, 
So Gideon's just asking for some money here, basically, because he's like, well, give me the earrings of his prey. And the people they defeated had earrings. So, which is, the, you know, again, they were Ishmaelites, the, the Midianites. And um, verse 25 says, And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast there in every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. So that's quite a bit of that's quite a bit of gold. Beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. Verse twenty-seven. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. So Gideon says, you know what? Don't make me ruler, don't make me king, but give me this gold. Give me all this gold. And he took the gold and he made this, this ephod. And it became, it basically became like an idol because it says the children of Israel went whoring after it. He, it says he's put it up in his city, even in Ophrah. Now, if you recognize the name Ophrah, you know, there's always this, Gold is referenced, even the, even the gold of Ophrah is known for this gold. And I think when we see the wording here, it's not just a coincidence, it says, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. I think we see one bad attribute of Gideon here where I think he started to love money. And, and this ends up just being the end of, of Gideon. Gideon dies and then his, his house, is, his posterity is destroyed after him. We're going to get into that next week. But um, look at the words there where it says, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house? 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. So this became a snare and they that will be rich fall into a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And, and it gets you into other hurtful lusts and stuff. And we see that Gideon had all kinds of, he multiplied wives unto himself. He had lots of wives, he had lots of kids because they had so many wives and concubines and things like that. And he, he wanted this gold, he built this ephod, and it just became a snare. It became, a, it was something that never should have been made to begin with. She had no business doing, leave it alone, you don't need all the riches. Even if you get all this gold just to make something, why? Why? There's no purpose to it. It, it just ended up being a stumbling block. It became a trap, a snare. Uh, verse 28 says, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. And we're going to see again, as we see so many times throughout the book of Judges, Hey, Gideon's here. They wanted him to be king. They wanted him to be ruler. They were so thankful. And they had peace and quietness for 40 years. But you know what? Their hearts weren't right. Verse 29 says, And Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten. For he had many wives. So he had 70 kids. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, and Ophrah of the Abi Israelites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, look at that, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal beareth their God. I don't know if that phrase, I know it hasn't been to this point, but I don't think that that phrase is even used in other places in Judges, like, as soon as he died. I mean, it's like they were just waiting for Gideon. He had the command and the respect as he judged Israel. But it's like, as soon as he died, they're just like, yeah, we're going after this God. We're going after Baal. We don't want to serve the Lord anymore. How quickly they forget. How quickly. I mean, 40 years. They were in body. They had 40 years of, prosper of peace. It doesn't even say prosperity. They had 40 years of peace where they weren't being killed, where they weren't having all their food eaten, where they w weren't having to hide everything and do everything in secret and live in the dens of the rocks because of the Midianites that they lived in fear of, that they couldn't even help the guy fighting against them because they were so afraid of him. Forty years of peace and now all of a sudden it's, oh, who's the Lord? I want to go follow this God. Let's go, f let's go after Satan again. 
Let's go after the ways of the heathen in the world. So quickly. So quick. A nation with a righteous leader could just turn. As soon as he was dead, the children of Israel turned again, went whoring after Balaam and made Baal beer at their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. And he did. He led them. He fought for them. He refused to rule, which actually is a kindness that he had done unto them because it was in their best interest not to have him be the ruler and um, told them God should be their, their ruler. All these things. Gideon did all this stuff. He put his neck on the line. He went, sir, he's dead. Okay. We're not going to show any respect to his house anymore. We're not going to respect God. We'll go do our own thing again. So next week, of course, there's a lot more going on, a lot more exciting stories. But um, it's amazing how it's just, it happens and repeats and repeats and repeats. So don't think it a strange thing when groups of people, nations, what have you, of, of really you know, zealous or righteous people or great leadership, all, how quickly that can just turn. History repeats itself over and over again. And there's a reason why we keep seeing this in Bible. And don't think that they were just so different than anyone else that only they could act like that. No. No. God didn't make people different on their, you know, ancestry as far as their basic desires, their basic attitudes, their flesh, you know, th these things, that whatever you go after, the, the not being, um, you know, they're, they're continuing to turn after other gods. This isn't unique to Israel. Any people is like this. So don't, you know, it's easy to say, oh, the Jews, oh, the Jews, oh, the Jews, look at how stupid they were and look at, how, you know. I think that's people. Can all have equally the same type of stupid attitude. Yeah, were they stupid? Yeah. A lot of people are, though. It's not, it's not unique to any one group of people or race or whatever. It's, you, you, that's, that's the human race. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the, the great teachings we could find in your word, Lord. I pray that you please just help us to be strengthened as we read some of these stories, Lord, um, that they would encourage us, strengthen us. Lord, help us to, um, to not be fearful and have the boldness that we need to step up and to, and to fight, God. And I thank you for all the, the blessings that you've given everybody here, especially myself, Lord, um, to be able to, to, to do things for you. And we know that, that you're there for us. You hear us. You, you hear our prayers. And that um, your strength is made perfect in our weakness, Lord. And um, that's what we'll glory in. And we thank you so much for using us. Help us to find and lead more people to Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.